Hi guys, welcome to Guardian Radio. Tonight we have Andrea Perron, and we are going to play a video to start. I see we have a couple people in the chat room so far, so that's good. Um, let's get it going, and then she'll introduce herself, and we'll have a fun night planned. Here we go. June 2010. 30 years ago this month, the Perrin family departed their place in the country, an old farmhouse in Harrisville, Rhode Island. They had lived there for nearly a decade, dwelling among the spirits in a house alive with death. Introducing House of Darkness, House of Light, the true story of a family now ready to share their secrets with the world, because the world is finally ready for the truth. Twilight was often when it began, the time of day when it became night, and there would be no halting the natural conversion, better to embrace an inevitable transition. It was the time when spirits began crossing over, in and out of sight, while shadows were cast by the waning sunlight. Many incidents occurred when it was difficult to distinguish what one was witnessing, as if the spirits were taunting mortals with their presence, apparitions, cries and whispers from beyond, beings who flirted with darkness, beings who existed somewhere just beyond the speed of light. Awesome. All right, do I still got you on the line? Oh, yes, I'm right here, honey. All right, I'm trying to get out of the video for some reason. <laughs> it's giving me a hassle. All right, here we go. So, would you like to introduce yourself further and talk about the video? Sure. Um, I'm Andrea Perrin, and I'm the author of House of Darkness, House of Light, which is a collective memoir uh, and a chronicling of the events which occurred between June of 1970 and June of 1980, when my family dwelled in an ancient farmhouse in Harrisville, Rhode Island. Our family waited 30 years to tell this story. And we, we did that with purpose and reason because what we experienced in that farmhouse as a family of seven, uh, what we endured and what we were exposed to in terms of spirit and enlightenment and terror um, was just, it was too intense for us to absorb. It took decades for us to all reconcile what we experienced there and to grow into our knowledge, so to speak, to mature and gain life's wisdom and be able to put the pieces of it together. And there are still so many questions that we each have about what exactly happened in that house. But one thing that I do know for certain, and the only thing that I know for certain, is that there is some form of existence beyond our mortal experience and the line between this dimension and the next one is very thin indeed. In fact, it barely exists at all. And I think that what's happening is that as more and more people allow themselves to have supernatural experiences, when they encounter some form of spirit, whether it be a visiting ancestor or a pet that passed away but was suddenly there for a split second in the side of your eye. That's real, too. That's reality, too. Mm -hmm. It's not just our five senses. There's a sixth sense at work. And if we develop it, and if we are true to our own emotions, our own sensory perceptions, our own feelings and instincts and intuitions then we will come to understand, accept, and embrace the other side. And I think that's what we all took away 
from our experience at the farm. But it was a truly miraculous and compelling and intense experience for the 10 years that we lived there and virtually grew up there. I was only 12 years old when we moved in at the farm. My baby sister, April, was five. And we were like little stepping stones, you know, five kids, seven years mm -hmm. Catholic. Um, and uh, so I've known for practically my entire life that there is no reason to fear death unless you live this life in such a way that when you do pass away, you are somehow tethered as an earthbound spirit. And I think that there are reasons for that. Because when we moved into that house, Danielle, eight generations of people had lived and died in that house before us. And some of them never left and are there now and are able to manifest in that house and have some historical tie to it. And we did a lot of research. My mother did a great deal of historical research around the farm in the years that we lived there. And we determined that there were a number of spirits in that house who were the disembodied soul, the in, disincarnate of a person who had lived in that house prior to our arrival. Um, and we were, to some extent, able to identify them. Without giving the book away, can you talk about one of your experiences or a small story within... <laughs> yeah, I know there's a lot, so... <laughs> there's so much in the books, in all three of the books. The okay. first one is out, the second one's coming very soon. Okay. Um, that I could talk for hours and hours and hours and not give away the book. Okay. <laughs> there, would, well, there would be so much more... <laughs> That that's not a problem. Okay. That's not an issue at all. Um, we had many experiences. Um, one of the first things, well, the first thing that happened was when we moved into the house, it was the first week of January of uh, 1971, even though we purchased the house in 1970. We didn't move in until after Christmas, the beginning of the new year. And we had spent a great deal of time at the farm prior to moving into it because we became very friendly with Mr. Kenyon, who was the owner and had been there for many decades. And he had been there alone for some time because his wife had died. And his son wanted, his son built him a beautiful little house, just a little ranch uh, on his own property in town and moved his father into a house with all the amenities. But Mr. Kenyon always missed his farm and came back frequently to visit with us. Um, we moved into that house, and Mr. Kenyon wasn't completely packed and ready to go yet. And his son and daughter-in-law were there, and they were helping him. And my sister Cindy walked into the dining room and saw a man standing uh, behind the door, kind of ajar, adjacent to the, the door, and he had his head cocked off to the side and kind of a quirky grin, and his foot was up, and it looked like it was braced against the wall. And at first she thought he was just another person in the room until he vanished. Uh, a few minutes later, my sister Nancy saw him, and that was our first experience the day we were moving into the farm. Um, we later determined that that was probably Johnny Arnold. Um, he drank horse liniment and killed himself in the eaves of the house in the 1800s. Uh, there were many spirits, and their manifestations took many different forms. So sometimes there would be an occurrence or a manifestation, and you were not able to identify what spirit it was. There were times that we would each feel compelled to want to communicate with what we were seeing happen and being unable to. My sister Cindy calls that sensation being in the bubble. 
And then there were times that we wanted to run and scream and yell and, and were unable to. Um, and then there were times where there was running, screaming, and yelling, and no one in the house could hear you. Uh, I can't explain it. I wish that I could, but I can't explain what what warped reality to such an extent that you could be having a horrible encounter with something that was so hideously ugly you couldn't wrap your mind around it and be screaming and hear yourself screaming and have someone who was eight or ten feet away not be in any way aware of what was happening to you. It's their ability to manipulate what we perceive as our uh, sensory environment that was um, quite compelling and quite disturbing at times. But my sister Cindy says that the thing that she will always remember and take away, took away from the house in terms of her level of fear was that second before a door would open or you'd hear footsteps and then they'd stop and then you'd wait for the door to open. And Cindy said it was the not knowing what was on the other side of it that was the most petrifying sensation for her. Cindy is um, very psychically attuned. Of the five girls, I'm the eldest of five girls. And of the five of us, I would say Cindy is the one who is um, most affected, who, has, who is most aware of her guides, who is always in the presence of spirit. And you'd never know it from conversing with her or interacting with her. Um, she seems so completely and perfectly normal on every conceivable level that you you wouldn't realize it. But she is um, she's really a remarkable, a mystical creature, ethereal. I think is how I would have to describe Cindy. Um, but we all had experiences there that were, in many ways, mind bending. And yet, cumulatively, my, fa my four sisters, my father, if you put all of us together and all the experiences that we had together, it was nothing compared to what my mother went through. There's a spirit in the house, and I use that phrase as present tense. There is a spirit in the house who perceives herself to be the mistress of the house, even though she's long dead. We think that it's Bathsheba Sherman. Uh, we're not positive about that, but Mrs. Warren of Ed and Lorraine Warren, uh, they investigated the house. Mrs. Warren always insisted that it was Bathsheba Sherman. Um, however, based on some of the archaic language that she used, it could have conceivably been Mrs. Arnold who hung herself in the barn. Uh, Mrs. John Arnold. Um, she was quite old, 93 years old, when she climbed the ladder and threw the rope across the top bowed beam. We don't know. Whatever apparition appeared in the house was very threatened by my mother. She lusted after my father, and there's just no polite way to put it. She lusted after my father. Um, and approached him in many ways. And she coveted us, the five children. Um, she approached my sister Cindy one time and said, come to me, little girl, with her hands outstretched, except that she, does, she doesn't have hands. Whenever she manifests, her head looks like a desiccated hornet's nest. There are vacant holes um, in the sockets for the eyes and wiry sprigs of hair, and her head is cocked off completely to the side. And it's obvious that her neck is broken, which is another reason why my father thinks that that's probably 
actually Mrs. Arnold and not Bathsheba Sherman. There's, we're never going to know. It's just part of the mystery, really. It's a dispute, but you know, it, it doesn't even matter. What matters is that we saw them. What matters is that they impacted our lives on practically a daily basis for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And we got to know them. And we were able to, in some instances, recognize them. And they appeared and manifested repeatedly to many different members of the family, and sometimes simultaneously. Um, you know, I thought when I first introduced volume one of the book, and I'm just going to go off on a tangent here for just a moment. Danielle, I do that. You may have to rein me back in. But we... <laughs> We okay. endured a great deal of scrutiny in the time that we lived at the farm. Some of it of our own making, being little kids and going to school and saying to our friends, oh my God, you know, I saw this at the bottom of my bed last night, you know, and word gets around really fast. And, and once you start disclosing things like that, you really can't take it back. Um, and so some of it was of our own making. Um, unfortunately, Mr. and Mrs. Warren were um, so struck by the experiences that they had at the house that um, when they would do seminars and things like that, they would sometimes, you know, well, they would always talk about our house. And, uh, you know, local people started putting it all together that would attend the seminars. And, you know, before you knew it, we had a lot of visitors, unexpected company at the farm. And, you know, people who would say sometimes hurtful things. Um, you know, my mother had been called a witch. We were called pagans. We were, you know, kind of dismissed from our church. You know, it, it was hurtful. It was painful because we weren't lying. We were expressing precisely what we had seen. We were forced to believe our own eyes. It's, you know, at some point you can't dismiss these things anymore. It's so in your face. Um, and so we didn't, um, we let all these years pass, all these decades really, before really beginning to tell this story. And I knew when I began it needed to be a full chronicle of events. It needed to be authentic from every member of the family involved. It had to be. And I really thought by, you know, it's been out for, what, 10 months, 11 months. Um, I really thought by now I would start to hear people saying, well, that must have been some kind of, you know, group uh, hysteria or, you know, something like that because we heard those things 30 years ago. I haven't heard it once. People are so much more mature now. Um, most people, you're an exception to the rule in terms of what you do by having a program like this, and you're so young, and we just spoke about, oh, the future ahead of you is amazing. I mean, you're really a marvel. Um, but mm -hmm. most people that are involved in the paranormal are my age. And they've been doing it for years and years, and, and their fascination has just been incredible. And sometimes that gets passed on the, the thirst for knowledge gets passed from parents to children and to their children. And the paranormal community has burgeoned in a way it is millions of members around the world that consider themselves to be members of the paranormal community. It really is an incredible thing. This didn't exist 30 years ago. The world has changed, and people, through a variety of means, I believe, have searched for their own spirituality on many different levels, um, some have looked beyond themselves. Some have searched within themselves. Some have based their, as we did, our solid foundation of faithfulness on the experience that we had in that house. Um, it really was the cornerstone to my spiritual development. Um, I didn't really find any answers in religion. 
I found my personal answers um, with the metaphysicians, with Emerson, Walden, Thoreau, um, Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass, you know. Mm -hmm. The earth is a magical place and a sacred ground, all of it. But I grew up in a house that I often tell people was a portal cleverly disguised as a farmhouse. I think there is so much energy and so much spirit, um, not just, there was so much pain that took place there and so much grief and so much loss that took place on that farm that in many ways there's like a pallor about it, a certain off color about it. It truly is like stepping into another dimension. I have multiple stories that I can tell you of things that have happened to other people there, truly miraculous things that have happened to people when they were on that property, in that house, in that barn, on the land. The energy there is almost, in fact, it's not almost, the energy there is vibrational. You can feel it in the rocks of the stone walls. You can feel it in the floorboards as you walk through that house. And I've been very fortunate in the um, aspect that the people that own the house now um, are just lovely. They couldn't be more wonderful. And for the 24 years that they've lived in that house, I've known them and I've had full, complete access to my old childhood home whenever I've wanted it. And it's been good for me. I think it's been healing for me to have been able to visit it as frequently as I have over the years. I was the lone holdout. When all the rest of my family lived down south, I still lived in Rhode Island. And so it was 10 miles away from where I lived and whatever I wanted to felt any need to go walk the land or just see the place you see what they've done I could just drive up the road and be there and it was comforting to me in an odd way I, I missed my spirits I think I always have I mean we developed kind of most of them were perfectly lovely and wonderful and benign uh, didn't really do anything but cause a little mischief now and then um, they weren't the issue. It was the mistress of the house who was so threatened by my mother and who threatened my mother repeatedly and threatened my mother with fire when she had five little children sleeping above her head. Um, my mother went through hell and God bless them. The Warrens tried, they tried to help us. They did. It's just that what is in that house is more powerful than our knowledge of it. And in the process of trying to help us, they unleashed, well, the medium actually, who was running a seance in the house, unleashed an unholy host. And the only time in the 10 years that I lived in that house that I was terrified. Terror doesn't touch it. I don't think a word exists to describe the feeling of watching something happen before your eyes that are hidden in the dark hallway, peeking through a doorway. I thought I saw my mother die. And I will never, ever ever be involved with anything having to do with the dark arts. I will never sit in on the seance. I don't do investigations. I'm surrounded by spirits all the time. I had so much wonderful help, just encouragement and support writing these books. I felt it, the warmth of it all the time. So many things have happened to me personally since I began writing the book, but I will... I, I will never be involved in anything 
that opens that door again. I wasn't involved at the time I was a witness, and the real blessing that came from that horrible, horrible night is that my mother had no recollection of it when it was over. That was the silver lining, if you please. But it was the worst experience of my life. And the whole story of what happened is in volume two. People say to me all the time, oh, it can't, it can't get more intense than this. It can't get more, you know, it's like, you have no idea what's coming. You have no idea what's coming. Uh, there's a reason we waited 30 years to tell this story so that somebody would believe us. And as it turns out, it, at least in my heart, it feels like everybody does. We have no reason to lie about this. I mean, they're making a movie, though. The Warrens, well, Ed sadly passed away uh, mm -hmm. several years ago. But on his deathbed, he asked his wife, Lorraine, to be sure that before she joined him, she did everything in her power to tell this story. Because, I mean, I think they only visited the house six times. But many things happened while they were there. And, um, in fact, I think their presence really stirred things up in some ways, at least from my perspective. I think I was 14 or 15 years old for, for the bulk of the time that they were involved in the case. And so uh, I remember very vividly, very well, their presence in the house and how it really activated the place. Because um, Lorraine's a, a medium, a psychic. She's... Mm -hmm totally in tune and Ed was the kindest most compassionate loving man I mean just a teddy bear he was so kind and, and so good to the five of us very careful how he interviewed us and asked questions and didn't always tried to comfort us he's a very loving man um, but anyway she did it I mean she got the the right people involved, and they just started filming the movie, The Warren Files, that's about this story. Um, and it's their version of events. There might be a few discrepancies. They remembered it a little differently than we did. But, you know, I, with, I know what they had to work with because they had tons of files and tons of files. The Warren Files, it's perfectly named. Um, it used to be called The Conjuring until about a few weeks ago, and then they realized, I guess, that The Warren Files was the perfect title for this film. Um, and the Warrens always insisted over all these years that even though they did probably upwards to 50,000 investigations over a 50-year career together as paranormal researchers, they always insisted that our story was the most significant, most disturbing, and most intense of all of the hauntings that they ever researched and investigated. Every um, time they conducted part of their investigation at the house, there would be more revelations. Um, they were really able to extract a great deal of information from us because there was a level of trust, and they were so nice. I mean, they were just nice to us. And we were used to being shunned, you know, it was so great to talk to somebody that got it, you know, that understood. Yeah. Um, and so we answered their questions honestly, and my mother shared a great deal with them. Uh, so they have a lot to work with in terms of putting this film together. And we're all excited, although I have to tell you that it's bizarre to click on the internet and look at the picture of the little girl that's playing me. <laughs> it's very strange. Um, but, you know, we'll all get used to it, I guess. We wish them well. They just started filming about a week ago, and they didn't use the house actually where it is now. They rebuilt it. It looks quite different now than um, the people who own it now did an incredible restoration job, and they brought it back to its colonial roots. Um, the land that it's built on, the property um, for the original estate, was part of the Providence Plantations, uh, deeded in 1680. And the house was completed as it stands now in 1736. Okay. 
So the history is incredible. It's, it's just, it goes on and on. And I know that there are many aspects of it and many things that we don't know because the records, the historical records are incomplete. But we, we do know a lot about what happened there as well. And some of it is absolutely heartbreaking just heartbreaking little prudence arnold all of 11 years old had her throat cut after she was raped on that property in that house by a farmhand it's in the public record um her epitaph wolves it'll rip your heart out You can feel the grief in that house when we sit and talk about it. We say all the time, you know, <laughs> we could all come in from an outing or being so happy and, you know, off to Rocky Point Park or off doing something together as a family and come back to the house. And it was like a shroud of blackness was thrown over us. Everybody either collapsed from sheer exhaustion as though the oxygen had been sucked out of their lungs or it completely altered the mood. And you could tell that there was something going on. The house would be ice cold, ice cold. See your breath cold in the middle of August. You know, it, it, we had to learn to live with it. At some point, we had to accept our circumstances and realize that we were on some level privileged to see what we saw, feel what we felt, hear what we heard, smell. You could even at times taste the acrid aroma on in your hard palate. I mean, it was that palpable. And we each in our own way and in our own time had to get past whatever fear we had and come to accept and share space because it's their house too. And I firmly believe there are some of them in that house that don't know they're dead. They either died so suddenly or so tragically that they don't realize they're dead. And perhaps that's what holds them. Mm. Uh -huh. you're allowed to ask me a question I'm going to take a breath now <laughs> <sighs> I just looked at the clock okay Andrea you've been talking for 38 minutes straight well it says 33 know. on here but <laughs> oh okay all right well you I know, won't I count the half, half hour blind, we've been talking. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh well, well I, I have a cat that's trying to seduce me right now. I mean, how awful is that? She's just a kitten, and it's her first heat, and she won't leave me alone. She's trying to climb my leg and mate with my slipper, and, you know, it's like, <laughs> honey, settle down. Just settle down. It's I had that problem right. with the dog it. here. <sighs> Before we moved into this house, the owner's dog... I sat down, okay, it was one of the worst mistakes I ever did, was I sat down, it's a huge dog, it almost broke my leg, trying to, <laughs> and it like it liked young women and tall men, that was a requirement for this dog. Yeah, well, you know, they have instincts too, and oh, bless her little heart, I mean, she's scheduled to be spayed, and we can't get it done because she keeps, you know, it, it won't stop, <laughs> she won't stop. Oh, she wants to have the babies in the worst way. Uh, you know, see, I, I, I never got married. I never had children. My babies are my, my pets. And uh, my Gracie Pearl, my beautiful doggie. Um, so, mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm just, I never felt the urgency that this cat feels right now to breed. And I'm so glad for it because I think I'm just, I'm too focused on everything else in life to raise a child. I don't think I would have been successful at that. <laughs> uh, I'd rather write and do theater and do plays and write this and sing that. And I've just, I've been a musician and a uh, stage actor for decades. And um, 
that's what I really, really enjoy in life. Just I love the solitude of writing. So in terms of putting this memoir together, uh, it really was a, the fulfillment of a dream for me because I wanted to leave something behind in the world that was of importance, that um, left a mark and touched hearts and minds. And I knew from a very young age that at some point in my life, I would tell the story of what happened to us in that house. I knew I would. I, I was just a young teenager when I realized that what I was living through was exceptional and that I needed to remember everything. And my mom was good, too, about keeping a, a very detailed journal. Um, and I, of course, have all of mine. I've kept one forever. Um, my sisters started coming to me within days of us moving into the farm. Um, January 1971, it was a harsh winter. It was, it was unbelievable. The amount of snow that we got, the shoveling, it was like a full-time job. Um, and the house was so cold. And then, of course, when they were apparitions, entities, manifestations of spirit, it would get colder while that was happening. <laughs> Hard to believe that it could, but it did. Um, it was a very uncomfortable environment in a lot of ways, many levels. But my sister Cindy would crawl into bed next to me at night. And this started literally less than two weeks after we were living in the house. And we would all kind of crawl in with each other. I had the biggest bed of all, so I could hold two sisters extra. And um, Cindy would lean over to me and say, I heard voices again. I keep hearing these voices. They keep telling me there are seven dead soldiers buried in the wall. And I heard this astonishing sound. And Cindy heard it, too. I think everybody heard it over the course of the years we were there. But it was an archaic horn um, that would call in the night. And I, I didn't, I wasn't able for years to identify it for what it was. But it wasn't until I was much older and I was driving past uh, a reenactment from uh, some historical society in Lincoln, Rhode Island was reenacting something from the Civil War, a Revolutionary War. And uh, I heard the horn, and it sounded exactly like the horn that I grew up listening to at what sounded like a distance or if it was just ringing through the eaves of the house. And it was a clarion call. It was a call to arms. That house existed during the Revolutionary War. That house existed during the Civil War. It existed during the running of the, uh, the saving of thousands of lives, running people through it as part of the Underground Railroad. It has an extraordinary history. And we don't know it all. We only know bits and pieces of it, but what we know is fascinating enough. And I don't know what Hollywood's going to do in terms of, you know, all their industrial light and magic. I have always insisted that the story's phenomenal enough in its own right. But of course, you know, they have to try to, to the best of their ability, show what we saw. So, you know, it'll be fascinating to see where they go with this, but this is, um, this is a story unlike any other, Danielle. I know of nothing even remotely like it in print anywhere in the world. Um, if anyone else has had experiences like our family uh, did over the course of that decade, they haven't told and it was time to tell. It was time to tell the truth. I wasn't but three months, maybe three months into writing the book when um, 
Hollywood expressed an interest in telling our story through the Warrens. So it was like we were all like-minded. We all came to the same conclusion at the same time that it was time to tell this story. So in that respect, I guess it's it's you know, a simpatico in nature. Um, it is such a privilege for me, truly, to share this story with other people, to be able to reach out through cyberspace. And I get letters every day. I get letters every day from readers who tell me how profoundly touched they are by this story. The booksellers do not know how to classify it. It's classified in everything from supernatural to religion, faith, politics, spirituality, metaphysics, uh, dark arts, occult, paranormal, um, investigations, mysteries, history. They don't know where to put it because it's everything. It's everything. It's our personal drama as a family. It's a comedy. It's, uh, we had many, that's why it's called House of Darkness, House of Light, because it's so much more than doom and gloom. I mean, it would be such a horrible and morose story. People would naturally ask, why did you stay? You know, and we, we get that. And there's a, there's a good long reason for it. And it's a multi-layered reason for it that we stayed, but we stayed. And um, there were many wonderful experiences that we as a family had together at that farm. And I wouldn't trade any of it for the world. I have absolutely no regrets about moving there. Um, if I have any regret wrapped around it at all, it's about parting with the place. But the last winter that we were in the house as a family, my mother confronted my father and she said, if we don't leave, I won't survive another winter in this house. I won't. This is it. This is the last winter I will spend in this house. And he believed her. And the abutting landowners ended up buying the house and then stayed there. I don't know exactly what happened. There's all kinds of stories that circulate around that. Um, suffice to say that uh, they didn't stay long. Uh, a lot of people have come and gone from that house that didn't stay long. But the people that live there now moved in knowing that the house was haunted, knowing a lot of its history and um, a lot about what happened to us through various sources, mutual friends. You know, Rhode Island's a very small state. Everybody knows everybody. Um, at least it feels that way. And, um, and in the town of Burrowville, it's especially true. Everybody does know everybody. And so they, they knew. Um, but they went in, unlike us, you know, who went in having no idea, no expectation about there being any kind of supernatural activity in the house, when they crossed its threshold, they did with a different attitude, a different... Um, a level of acceptance that they had already attained prior to moving into the house. And there was never any threat posed by them being there. They basically announced, we're the caretakers. You know, we, we know you're here. We, we get that. Just you know, leave us in peace and let us take care of the place and, and do right by it. And they certainly have. It is, it's... It's like a living museum. It is absolutely spectacularly beautiful. And they've done so much to restore it to its authentic roots as a colonial dwelling. Um, whereas it was really more of a unique farmhouse when we lived there. It had had a front porch added on hundreds of years after it was built which we loved. I mean, the front porch being gone off of it feels foreign to us now. Um, but um, it's essentially the same place. Interestingly, the barn is as active as the house is. Um, I've gotten some incredible and just mind-blowing photography 
uh, captures in the barn. Um, and it's mostly because of, uh, I was always the shutter bug in the family going back to when I was a little itty bitty. I was the one that made sure there was film for the camera. I was the one that made sure that the pictures got taken. Um, and, um, you know, we have some very, in the first book, I think there's a couple of dozen of our uh, of vintage photographs from the time that we lived there, and there'll be as many in the second volume. And then the third's got a whole chapter of photographs from the farm with little stories attached of who was doing what when. Um, it's really a remarkable volume. In all three books combined, it's about 1,600 pages. I applaud anyone with the veracity to read it. And yet I receive letters all the time from people that say, I'm on my second time through, and oh, I forgot about this happening, and oh my God, I can't believe that happened. Oh, how did I not remember that from the first reading? Because there's so much, and then a lot of times people will write and say, you know, I read 100 pages and I had to put it down for a few days. I had to step away from the book. Um, you know, people have different reactions to it, but... It really is something that stays with you. It's not a story that you'll read and forget. I can promise you that. Okay, now you're allowed to talk if you have a question. <laughs> <laughs> Bless your heart. You've been so tolerant of me because I've had way too much coffee tonight. And now I'm drinking tea. That's like adding insult to injury. Go ahead, ask me a question. Trust me, I love hearing stories more than most people. My, cool. um... My my grandparents, they you know, they didn't live that long, but my grandma, you know, I love to hear her stories and everything before she passed. So whenever I have a friend just tell me a story, I'm like, okay, just keep going, keep going, because I love it. I love to hear those kind of stories. Um, based on my experience, too, I wanted to ask, so you do believe that there was some demonic energy in there as well as spirits? I don't it sounds know. like it. I'm afraid to label it. I don't know. The book poses more questions than it answers. I think the only question that it legitimately answers for someone who's searching is, yes, there is something um, beyond. But um, other than that, I don't know. Um, I do know that we had several incidents in the house that I think anybody objectively looking at it would say yes that was demonic in nature including what happened to my mother mm -hmm. the night of the seance um, which was just absolutely horrific but Cindy and Nancy both had experiences in the house that uh, involved something heinous something very threatening and very ugly and very evil and I don't know if I believe in Satan. I don't know. I don't know. But I do believe that evil exists in the world. And I don't know if human beings have simplified these intrinsic concepts of good and evil by assigning personas to them. Mm -hmm. God is good. Satan is evil. You know, if that's our own making, um, because that's where our comfort level allows us to go, I think that there is a, a great and almighty, wonderful power, the force, a goodness, a God consciousness in the universe that we all tap into and that we're all expressions of. But if it is omnipresent, and exists throughout the universe, is evil not a part of it? Is it secondary to it? Is Does it succumb to it? It seems to me, over the course of human history, the, manifest, the manifestations of evil are too numerous to count. The atrocities are too horrific to recall. And yet it seems to me that the vast majority of people are good, kind, loving people who want to harm no one 
who only want to live their lives in peace and tranquility, in harmony with others, and spread love. And that's my experience of human beings, that there's this tiny little percentage that are the manifestation, mortal manifestation of evil. And then there's everyone else. And it's been a constant struggle throughout recorded history for human beings to war with each other, to seek peace, and ultimately, in the vast majority of cases, good vanquishes evil. But I I don't see how anybody could argue that these, as we've defined them, don't exist. I think it's obvious that there is a philosophical delineation between goodness and evil, and that they are polar opposites, and yet the intermingling between them can get very complicated when you put in that mortal equation because we're such complicated beings in our intellects. And, you know, I mean, there are serial killers running around out there. How does that happen? You know, there are lifelong pedophiles that just offend and offend and hurt and maim and kill and and how does that happen is it not natural is goodness and evil intricately and irrevocably entwined with each other is that part of our human experience is that part of is it the defining of these concepts which give us our clarity as human beings and help us to grow and learn and digest what we experience in terms of our sensory perceptions while on this plane of action? I don't know. Uh, That's the only answer that I can give you because it's the honest answer. But I think that there is intrinsic value in discussing and exploring these concepts. I think that when we do so, when we get beyond the mundane in life and we focus on our higher energy and our higher power and we manifest God consciousness, I think it it essentially liberates us, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. It, It gives us at least some level of confidence that we will be able, if we live well, if we live true to ourselves in good faith, if we are kind and loving, if we practice the golden rule, do unto others as they w- as you would have them do unto you, and my one of my other favorite phrases, do unto others as if you were the others. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm-hmm. Um, if you live that way, I think your spirit moves on because you fulfill your destiny here. You you do your part and you live your life well and then you move on. And I think that a lot of spirits that are trapped in this earth and in this realm, whether they be just mean-spirited spirits or somehow attached to a demon, I don't know. Um, I've seen enough to know that it's not something that we should mess around with. I've seen enough to know that we don't know enough. Mm -hmm. That's why um, I believe in studying it and knowing what you, you know, using what you know to help people, but not taking the ego and the pride to say that you know everything. Oh, God, no, that would be so disingenuous. That would be, I'm, I'm not a sage, I'm not a prophet, I'm a messenger. And the message is being well received. The people that are reading this story, that are hearing of this story for the first time, a lot of people have known a lot about it for years and years. It it got around. It it just did. Um, But they were pretty well centrally located in Rhode Island and the surrounding area, Connecticut, Massachusetts. But there are people all over the world that are reading this story and hearing of this for the first time. And they're blown away. Um, but nobody has thus far 
challenged us or, or dared to call us crazy. And I rest my personal integrity and my reputation on these books, this trilogy. Mm -hmm. um, not only as a writer, as a professional, but as an individual. Um, there's nothing to lie about. This is what happened and exactly how it happened. And I'll tell you what, we hardly spoke about it amongst ourselves for decades. And yet when it was time to write this book and I approached my whole family and I said it's time to tell this story and I started before I, I already had all of my stuff down before I even told anybody else in my family and I assured them that I would handle it with sensitivity and that I would always be um, cognizant of their feelings. But I had to ask my family to exhume the dead for all intents and purposes. Mm -hmm. I had to ask them to dig up, dredge up some very painful memories along with some very good memories. And it was emotionally, it was devastating at times. It was... Um, heart-wrenching at times, uh, cathartic perhaps. In some ways it, it tore us apart and in other ways it brought us all together. It's, it's impossible, the dynamics are impossible to describe. Um, it all happened over the course of this last few years as I would sit for hours and hours and hours and endless hours working on this manuscript and interacting with my sisters. I relocated from Rhode Island to Georgia um, in March of 08 um, because I knew I had to be with my family in order to do this story justice and to make sure that I got it right, that I got all the details that they could remember. And, and I thought that it would be, in terms of compiling the stories, I thought that it would be a lot more difficult because I thought, naturally, over time, details would be lost. But when something that intense happens to you, it's as if it's impaled in your memory permanently, down to minutia of detail. And, you know, that's what I found to be the case with each member of my family. And we spent hours compiling stories and I thought okay when it's time to put it all together this isn't going to match what Nancy remembers isn't going to match what Cindy remembered of that event or what dad said isn't going to match what mom said and out of 1600 pages of a manuscript when all of it came together I had to change one season I got the season wrong that, that a particular event happened and I think I had to change it from fall to spring of the year that it occurred um, because I got outnumbered. Several people in the family said, no, that happened in, in um, the spring or the fall. And I had to go into the manuscript and change that. Um, and I described a vehicle the wrong way. And I had to go in and change that. But that was it. I mean, it just, it fell together as though it was meant to be. It fell together in the same way that we fell into owning this farm. I think on some level we were called to it. Uh, there, were, there was a confluence of events, a convergence as it were, um, that occurred from the starting about a year before my mother actually found the farm. We went from living, uh, we lived in Cumberland, Rhode Island, and we had really an idyllic night life. It was uh, a pretty little Cape Cod house and a very nice, very generous piece of property. And it was a very nice life. And it suddenly something changed. And it was as though our whole community was infiltrated by evil and bizarre, bizarre things happened. And my mother said, uh-uh, I'm getting my girls out of here. My father went away on a business trip, and my mom just happened to pick up a newspaper while I was at a flute lesson, and she didn't even get to look at it, really, until that night when we were all in bed. And she said she wasn't looking for a house. She was just being, you know, an exhausted mother sitting down reading a newspaper for the 
10 minutes that she had to herself all day. And she said this ad just kind of leapt out at her and she called the realtor at 9.30 at night, which is just downright rude, especially in 1970. And uh, the woman was very gracious, very generous, and she agreed to meet my mother the next morning. And my mother emptied our family bank account to put earnest money down on a farm that my father had not seen, did not know about. And um, she virtually bankrupted us with one check so that she could make sure that she secured this place. That's how much she knew it was supposed to be ours. And then, you know, once he got over the shock and horror and dismay of what she had done, he agreed to go look at it. She described it as the real estate deal of a lifetime, and then later the Sir real estate deal of a lifetime. Um, and he always said it was the house of our dreams and then our eventual nightmares. So I incorporated their sayings about the place into the story. Um, but it was like, Danielle, when we got there, I mean, just picture five little girls crammed into the back of a, a Bonneville Gold. It was a nice car. We have pictures of it. Um, and uh, mom and dad, not really arguing, but discussing dad wanted to know how he could get the money back you know he just like he really didn't expect this to be anything but on a lark he went just so that there wouldn't be any fight and then he would find out later how to get the money back um, and he fell madly in love with the place the instant he laid eyes on it just as my mother had um, I mean imagine a 200 acre farm and five little girls stepping stone style um, and Mr. Kenyon, sweet Mr. Kenyon, he loaded us up with sugar. He had pockets full of candy for us. And then after he'd gotten us all stoked on sugar, he just said, go, go play. And it was like we knew the place. It was like we knew the place. Every square inch of it, it was so familiar to all of us in inexplicable ways. And... We all had the strangest sensation when we went back to Cumberland, like we just didn't belong there anymore. It was as if we'd already moved. And it took another six months to get the money together and, and the survey done and the everything together to buy the house. And we visited many times. Um, and it always felt the same, like we were going home. And we were relegated to living in the little Cape Cod in Cumberland until we could go home. Um, it was it was bizarre. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we belonged there. I think that, and I'm not a believer in destiny per se. I mean, I have a degree in philosophy. I had, I had to study every religion in the world to get a degree in philosophy. You wouldn't think that that would necessarily be the case, but it is. They're very closely um, intertwined. And, um, you know, I was always a free will kind of gal. I really always, from little, itty bitty, just had a sense of my own free will. And, you know, I was aware of my, of my own consciousness. And thought that I got to, you know, write my own script every day and make my decisions on, are we going to play on the swings? Are we going to go toe-dabble in the pond? Are we going over to the monastery grounds to pick pears? Life was and upon reflection, in retrospect, I have to wonder if we were actually destined to live in that house. And I'll tell you a specific reason why. Um, and I've told this story before, and people who are regular listeners of, you know, who follow this story have heard this before, and so I apologize to them for any redundancy. But for those who haven't heard this, you need to know the reason why I believe that on some level, in some way, we were drawn with purpose and reason to that house. I think there is something familial in nature. Not familiar, based in family, based in either ancestry. We haven't found the link, but 
I came home for my 18th birthday from college um, in 1976. It was a very cold October day. I came home for the three-day Columbus Day weekend, which my birthday coincides with. And um, I ate on the plane. So back when they had food on planes. And I came home and I stood in front of the fireplace because I was cold to the bone. I was supernaturally cold. And the rest of my family was having dinner. And I was staring down at my feet, but all I could feel was the whole right side of my body felt like it was paralyzed with cold. And I just couldn't get warm. And I looked up because I heard somebody drop a piece of silverware on a china plate. And I looked up and my father was staring directly at me. In fr from the dining room into the into the parlor, but he wasn't staring directly at me. You see, he was staring off to my right, his left, and he said, "You have company. Somebody's here to welcome you home." And I just knew it. I knew it. I could only turn my head, just uh, just enough. The rest of my body just didn't feel like I could move it. Um, and I stared directly into my own eyes in a face of a woman that was dressed in 17th century clothing and much older than me at the time I was 17, your age. And um, I'm so proud of you for what you do. I mean, it really is, you're a remarkable woman. You really are. Um, I just had to slip that in, you know. I mean, I hope you've got a great following. I hope people recognize what your talents and abilities are. I mean, not that they've got to listen to you very much tonight, but, you know, I'm sure at other times you talk to them. And, <laughs> and, and they're very impressed with your skills. Um, Thank you. You know, I, was, I, I didn't discuss it for years with anybody in my family. I knew what I saw. I knew I saw my own face. I knew I saw my own eyes as though I were looking at a mirror image, a reflection of myself. Um, and I didn't want to discuss it with my family because I didn't want them to have the same sensation of dread and trepidation that I did when I saw her. And it wasn't that she was unkind. She had my eyes. I have very kind eyes. Um, I felt loved by her. I sent the, it was not a scary sensation in that respect. I wasn't being haunted. Mm -hmm. I was being welcomed. And that's very different. Um, but I knew at that moment that I, I knew for sure at that moment that in some way, some shape, some form, some incarnation, I had lived in that house before, that that was me from hundreds of years before. And I don't want to go back. And I think that by telling this story, by acknowledging our spirits in that house and the experiences that we had, and by perhaps thinning the veil a little more, by sharing this with the rest of the world, maybe that's my escape. Maybe that's my liberation. I don't want to spend eternity in that house for as long as it's there. I want to be released into the universe when I die. Um, and I have no fear of death. I have fear of lingering too long at the fair. <laughs> you know? I just, I'd like to move on across the universe, just like the Beatles said. Uh, so, hopefully... In telling this story from the heart. I mean, it was a true labor of love. It was heart wrenching to recall so many of these instances. But I think ultimately it will benefit anyone who reads the story, who has an open heart to it. Um, and I welcome skepticism, I welcome it because it's the skeptics 
that push us ever more. Those of us who know, who've had experiences like this, um, to reveal more, to uh, research more, to explore more. And it's all very healthy as long as the discourse remains civil. It's, it all adds to the conversation. Uh, there's no point in somebody getting into your face or my face and saying, you're a nut job and you see dead people and, oh my God, you're such a freak. It hasn't been their experience necessarily of life. You know, I got that kind of behavior from others as a child. And I have to tell you, it is, um, it's traumatizing to have your peers shun you for telling the truth. And I learned quickly to shut my big mouth, not talk about it. That's why I was isolated until just with coming out with the paranormal just a year and a half to two years ago. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing. People think you're a freak, even for saying hello nowadays to somebody yeah. in the wa- in the halls in high school. If I said hello to someone and I said have a good day, I was considered a whore, a freak, a slut, and I did none of those things. But then you look over the corner and you see people doing that. So where does the line cross? I don't know. I understand. You're, you're just you, who you are, how you think, what you do, wh- how you've evolved at such a tender age. Um, Danielle, you just, you know, that's, uh, that's not your crew, okay? <laughs> you need to just gravitate toward people who get you, and, and you'll be fine. And I've done the same thing. You know, I was out of, I had nothing to do, nothing to do with the paranormal community, I didn't know there was a paranormal community until Same. four years ago. I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. It wasn't anything that I researched or looked around for or gravitated toward. You know, I was from the been there, done that school of thought. I wanted to move on with my life. I focused on other things. And it didn't mean that I didn't have a sense of spirit guides around me. I'm a very spiritual person. I pray frequently. Uh, I'm not exactly positive what I'm praying to, but I have such a very strong sense of of the somethingness around me. Um, I've been bailed out I don't know how many times. Uh, you know, something stepped in to help me when I was in very severe trouble on three separate occasions in my life. Um, my life has been saved by something that interceded on my behalf at three different times in my life. I can't deny it, and I wouldn't. I would never even think of denying it. I'm proud to say that I'm so connected that whatever power it is that's watching over me is able to get me off of a highway when I am in a, a critically. Well, I'm about to die. I got caught in a snowstorm and my windshield wipers stopped once in uh, 1987, 88, I think. And something, my, my fingernails impaled the palms of my hands. I was hanging on for dear life onto the steering wheel in a squall, a blizzard. Um, and my windshield wipers stopped and I had an 18-wheeler in front of me, an 18-wheeler behind me and an 18-wheeler on my left side on a two-lane highway, I, um, the highway that goes out to the Cape from 195 that goes out to the Cape from downtown Providence. And I was out in a very desolate, remote part of that highway. And I should have died that night. And something steered my car very deliberately and carefully off that highway. And I felt it on my hands, on my hands steering the car off the highway. And all I had time to say was, God, help me. And God did. No matter what the energy is created, it's still, it's God in a way. It is. Well, all I know is that when any of us was in trouble, when there was something 
really oppressing us, imposing itself upon us in that house. Mrs. Warren used to tell us to say, in the name of Jesus Christ, go back to where you came from. Mm -hmm. But that didn't work for us. Speaking directly, (laughs) directly to the big guy seemed to be the only thing that broke it, that stopped it. Um, Cindy will attest to that. My mother will attest to that. I can attest to that. Christine can attest to that. Nancy, I don't know if April ever had to actually beg God for, I don't think she ever had, I don't think she was ever attacked in the house, April. But every one of us, uh, other than her that I know of, um, at some point, uh, invoked the name of God, begged God to make it stop, make it stop. Well, what's more powerful than going straight to the source? That's exactly how Nothing. I do it, too. Nothing. And I'll tell you what, when you have an experience that is so intense, that is so disturbing in that moment, and the only thing that makes any sense is to speak to your own creator, um, and then there is immediate resolution, that goes a long way toward, I, I can't see how it wouldn't make anyone a believer, that it wouldn't deepen the faith of any human being. Yeah. And it was, it was our salvation, our Savior, in that house, because there was something I can't, say definitively, though I suspect, demonic, but it was absolutely evil. And I don't know, as I said before, if that is one and the same, if it's two distinct entities, if it's a mean spirit and spirit versus the, you know, the devil incarnate, I don't know. But whatever it was, was um, not of this world. And yet... Of course it is of this world, or it wouldn't exist. Right. Well, in my opinion, it's the devil's playground. Jesus has come, in my opinion, because I'm Christian. But I came from a Catholic belief, too, so I don't have have the degree, but I study what you have, too, so I understand. But, you know, this is the devil's playground. It's the truth. If anything, this is our hell. You know, this is our hell, and then... What happens in the afterlife gets even worse than that. But, yeah, this is the devil's playground. So he's here. Believing it or not, the reason I ask is because I've dealt with the demonic more than I've dealt with the ghosts, even though I have. So your story, it hits an interest to me. I can't wait to read it. When does the second one come out? Uh, it should be out in, I would say, six to eight weeks. Okay. It's getting close now. Oh, oh. Oh, I'm so tired. <laughs> oh, I have yet to read the first one. I need to read the story. The way you advertise it, too, it's very enticing. So you, do, you guys are doing a very good job. For Thanks. Sure. It's been a lot of work. I would like to take a moment, since you brought that up, to acknowledge um, two people who have worked diligently with me. Um, Not only have I had the full-fledged support of my entire family around this project, but um, Manny Cantu is my cinematographer. He's all my videos uh, that are on my YouTube channel. He did the vast majority of them, and Margie Mursky did the rest. And she is, uh, she's a a wonder, wizard (laughs) she's she's magical margie i mean if you you know what a formidable web presence i have because i know you've been through it and um she's responsible for the vast majority of it and any part i played in it was only because she told me to to do something on this particular site or that particular site and to and to tell the world she taught me how to tell the world about this story um She's just incredible and has and is such a a grand supporter of this effort and has functioned as my partner from the inception. She believed this story 
the moment I told her, she, she said, I always knew there was something different about you. I always knew there was something special. There's a certain twinkle in your eye that I, I could not, I didn't know where it came from, and now I do. She says, you're one, you've seen things. You've seen things other people haven't seen. You know stuff other, other people don't know. But I really, I, I really don't consider, I'm very humbled by having had this experience, Danielle. It's um, really shaped me in many ways into who I am today. And I think that I was prepared finally. Everything that I've gone through in my life, as we were you know, talking about earlier, everything that I've gone through in my life brought me to the place where I was ready to tell this story and share it with the world. And I really do think of it as a gift. Unfortunately, I have to charge for it, but essentially it's a gift. Um, you know, I wish all books were free and that they printed themselves and there were no costs incurred. You know, it's, it's uh, but it's worth it. It's worth it. I promise you that it is. Uh, you can... Actually, I don't. You don't have a copy of it yet, right? Uh, no, I don't. Okay. Well, we'll make arrangements for that. Cause you need a signed copy of it, young lady. Yeah, I uh, do. <laughs> you do. Uh, so we'll talk after. Okay. Arrange that. Um, but uh, you'll never forget it. It will fundamentally change the way you think about a lot of things. If you allow yourself into the story, into the journey enough to open your mind to the possibilities that exist out there. Um, and if you have a chance, I think I sent you the link for uh, the Freaky Friday segment that NBC 10 did in mm -hmm. Providence. It's a four minute video. It's a special feature that they did on their news recently. And they did a phenomenal job, um, no pun intended. Uh, R.J. Heim, who was the reporter, put the segment together, and I worked closely with him. And I sent you the link to that. So if you'd like to play that for your guests um, when we're done, uh, that'd be great, because I'd love to share it with as many people as can see it. Um, but uh, And we'll get together again. I, The reason that... Um, you're just, you're a lovely person, and you've been so kind to me and very helpful to me from the other side of this country. You just seemed to gravitate toward this story and um, have done so much on its behalf to get the word out about it, and I thank you very much for that. Um, I mean, I think you were one of the very first paranormal people that posted all my stuff on your website and said, happy to do it. Wow. You know, so I'm very grateful to you, and it's really my pleasure to join you tonight and to finally get to talk to you in person and get to know you a little better. Um, but I really admire you, too. For, I mean, for your incredibly tender age to have evolved and to de have developed into the person that you are already is quite remarkable. And, you know, here you... You strive ever more, you want ever more, and that's great. But just take a moment to pat yourself on the back for all you've accomplished already, because it really is exceptional. And um, you need to be acknowledged for that among your own peer group and others in the paranormal community that consider themselves more evolved because they're older. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. You have to do the work up here, you know? So, um, anyway. Well, I've kept you for almost an hour and a half, honey. And um, I think that's a good you. dose of me for mm -hmm. one night. So I will uh, Well, we will actually had a off. question um, from the audience a while ago. Oh, sure. And I wanted oh, to thank you as well, because I, I know that you're really giving me props, and I appreciate that. Your work is great. I mean, I'm very interested to know what happens. I'm like a little kid when it like, came to Harry Potter in a way, you know? Yeah. I can put book, down the book, and I haven't read it yet, so I'm excited. Good. Um, Malky Wallace, I believe. I don't know if you know him or not. Malcolm. Malcolm Wallace. Oh, he's so great. I didn't know he was listening, and that's fabulous. Yeah. Hi, Malcolm. His username is uh, Malky, and I think he's on mine too. It's, his name is familiar. 
He's asking, if it's not giving too much of the book away, can she tell us more about the, I think it's Bathsheba? Bathsheba Sherman. Yeah, who she is uh, and how she died and um, might be still there. She died in 1885. She died a very old woman. But it wasn't really so much the end of her life that is of the greatest import, but when she was about your age, actually when she was exactly your age, um, she was caring for an infant. We have not been able to determine if it was her own baby or if it was someone else's, because she did lose three children um, in her, during her life that were under the age of three or four. But in this particular case, at your age, she was caring for an infant and the baby went into convulsions and died. This happened at our farm. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, they found a needle impaled in the base of its skull and she was accused of practicing witchcraft. She was accused of dabbling in the dark arts, having sacrificed this infant for eternal youth and beauty. She was apparently very beautiful, very lovely woman, young woman. And a lot of women in town really resented her, and the men looked at her a certain way, and they resented that, and there was a lot of... She had a reputation in town as being somewhat of a vixen even though, according to everything that we've learned about her, she never behaved that way. She was just accused of it. Well, now she finds herself being accused of sacrificing this baby. Um, and, of course, it was way before anybody knew what DNA was, and um, there was an inquest in Chapachet, which was at the time the county seat or the town seat, because I don't think Burlville had been officially incorporated yet as a town. So this occurred in the, what is now the next town south of the village. And she was, uh, it was dismissed. She was not found guilty or innocent. She was not acquitted per se. It was dismissed for lack of evidence. But she was never, ever able to live down the reputation, um, the rumors, the whispers, the innuendo. Um, and she died in a bizarre way. Um, in the, uh, She aged at a rapid rate after this and lived a very reclusive life. And word had it that she was a very bitter, angry, vindictive woman. Her aging was so rapid that in other people's journals of the time it was taken note of that. She's supposedly buried in the Riverside Cemetery in downtown Harrisville um, and it, she probably is buried there um, although there were rumors even at her death in the late 1800s that the church would not allow her to be buried in hallowed ground and that her family transported her body back to their property and disposed of her there, um, which was our home. Um, and, you know, we'll never know. I mean, should unless they were to exhume the body, no one's going to do that. We just need to leave it be, let her rest. But she was... Um, According to people who knew her later in her life, she was uh, a very unhappy human being. And according to the death records, her body virtually turned to stone. She died of what they called paralysis, uh, where she literally could not move. Um, and that's in her death record. And Mrs. Warren steadfastly believed that the entity that she sensed in the house was Bathsheba Sherman. Mm -hmm. <sighs> well, there you go, Malcolm. That's a quite a <laughs> description on that one. 
As far as um, events go, I know that PTVN, that you're going to be one of the featured guests. I really wanted to go to that. It's in Ohio, and I'm in California, so. Yeah, it's the Paracon in Ohio. Um, Brandon Kreitzer has put this enormous function together. He's this is going to be a coast to coast. Like, it, I'm so glad it's centrally located because people are going to come from everywhere. I've already got so many people coming in from New England, people coming up from the South. People are already building their summer vacations around this two-day event. Um, it's going to be great. Uh, they expect between eight and 10,000 people, and I'm so looking forward to it. Um, I, I went to college in Pittsburgh, so I have lots of people at Pittsburgh's my second home. And um, so I have friends coming in from there, and I'm very excited about that. I'm really not, until I get volume two out, I'm really not doing any book signings, any public appearances, anything like that. <laughs> Look how I got all fancied up for you tonight. <laughs> <laughs> You're lucky I'm not in my pajamas, okay? Um, but I do have my slippers on. Um, I'm in my pajamas, actually, so we're okay. There you go. We're good. <laughs> we're good. Well, you have no excuse. It's three hours earlier there. <clears throat> but um, I, uh, I'm not really, I'm not going to, do, until I get, volume two exactly precisely the way I want it all the photographs that I want on exactly the page that I want them to be on I'm just oh that my whole life is consumed with the process of creating volume two and it doesn't matter that it's been written for more than a year um the putting together of it the turning it from manuscript to book is a very big ordeal, and uh, it very time-consuming. So I'm not going anywhere or doing anything until Volume 2 is out. And then I'll be out and about, and I'll come visit people, okay? I have to go to Pennsylvania, and I have to go back to Rhode Island, and I have people waiting to see me in Florida. Come and to California. You know, in California, yeah. I do Actually, I do have people waiting to see me in California, but Northern California. Oh, God. Um, and I'll get around and I'll do all of that and it'll be great. <laughs> but it's just, it's wonderful to meet. Oh, God. The people in the paranormal community are just so exceptional. I've, I, I've in many ways, I've missed out all these years because I, I couldn't ask for a more loving, more embracing, more accepting group of people. You know, when I first wrote this book, it just seemed obvious to me that the the people that I should tell first about this story would be the paranormal community. Um, and then it would spread exponentially from there. And I have, I can't tell you how many people have stepped up, including Malcolm um, and Steve Pukwaji. <laughs> He's so cool. And so many people, so many people, Julie Griffin and, Oh, my God. Keith and Sandra Johnson. Oh, you have to read Keith Johnson, actually. I need to just step off here for a second and tell you. Keith Johnson has written two books. One of them, uh, the first one, Paranormal Realities, Volume 1, uh, has a whole chapter about our story um, because he was one of the very first people that came to help us, and he was no older than you. And he was already deeply immersed in spiritualism and the uh, supernatural. He had had many experiences as a child. It was a calling for him at a very young age. And he brought an uncanny level of maturity to it at a very young age, much like yourself. And um, Keith and I are fast friends, just I love him. He's, he's wonderful. And his wife, Sandra, are ex she's extraordinary. I mean, she's angelic, is what she is. And I want them to come to this Paracon thing. I want everybody out there that knows anything about them to encourage them to be a part of this. Um, I've gotten, you know, I'm putting the word out. <laughs> we, we need to get them there, because the, the contribution that they would make is enormous, and and I mean, Keith knows firsthand, I don't need anybody else. Keith alone validates everything. He knows all about this stuff. He's known for decades. 
about what happened to us in that house, and some of it happened to him, too. So it's, uh, he's written about that in his book, and, you know, that's a nice companion piece to, to House of Darkness, House of Light, and sheds light on it in his own respect. And, yeah, some of the details are a little off, and so what? He was there, I can attest to that fact, because... He was drop-dead gorgeous. I thought my sister Nancy was going to have a heart attack the first <laughs> time she laid her eyes on him. She's like, oh, yeah. I, I felt like saying, you're too young to feel like that about him. Get away from him. Get off of him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, like I said, there were some funny moments at the farm, even when things were disturbed. <laughs> Oh, God. But um, anyway, so I, I just had to, you know, give a, a shout out to, I don't even know if they're listening in, but Keith and Sandra are wonderful. And um, you can go on their link for their Ghosts Are Near program and watch. I've done a, a sit-down interview in their studio with them. And they also did a marvelous piece this past June. They went and did an investigation at the farm. And you can click on episode 79 of Ghosts Are Near and get a virtual tour of the farm that they put together. I wasn't there. I had to leave um, my book tour early. It was actually, they did it in October. It was not June, it was October. And I had to leave early because there was a death in our extended family. I wanted to get home to my mom. And so I had to postpone some book signings and put some things off. And I was originally going to go to the farm and do it with them and interview with them, have the owners interview with them. And, and Keith put the whole thing together himself in my absence and did a wonderful job. So if you want a virtual tour of that house, all you have to do is click on um, nearparanormal.com and go to episode 79 of Ghosts Are Near and you can walk through the farm. And that's a link I forgot to send you. So I wanted to tell you about it. My throat is so dry. (laughs) I just... Just don't look. If I'm on screen, don't even look. I'm just going to suck this tea down. <laughs> no big deal. Yeah. Um. So, anyway. Um, so, I'm. it's been a long day, babe, and I'm really tired. Does anybody else have any questions? I'll come back and do this with you again, I promise. I think we're definitely going to have another interview, another time to chat, and you're always welcome back. And, you Thank know, you. when you get the other book out, just let me know, and I'll put it I out will. there. I will indeed. And thank you for your to your listeners, everybody that's on the other side in cyberspace. I really appreciate it from all of you. And if anybody wants the book, you can, well, it's available everywhere. Um, and Amazon's got it. But the best place and the fastest way to get it, in my opinion, is just to go directly to the publishing website, which is authorhouse.com, and just click on bookstore and put in the name of the book, and it comes right up. And They'll have it to you in about four or five days. Okay. And I think I have the links up before you leave. Oh, good. Yes, that's right. I sent the links for you. Yeah. I have your LinkedIn. And there's a lot of different accounts, everybody. I mean, there's a lot of links, so you'll be able to find it in many places. And we've I got the... I sent you about half. <laughs> and Author House is up right now. And here's the link. Uh, you should be able to find it if you search it in from authorhouse.com. Uh, I made arrangements with them to discount it a little bit. And I know that's not going to be the case with the next volume because things have changed and they're going to set their own price because it's so thick. And I, I actually underpriced it for what it is. And but they they allowed it, and I went with a discount with them. So that's really the the least expensive way to get it and fastest. Well, for a nice sized book, that's a good price, especially nowadays. You know, mm-hmm. they're getting way more expensive. Well, I tried to keep it as the price points as affordable as I could so that people would um, have a, an opportunity to read the book. And it's also been an ebook right from the inception. I made sure that they put it out for Kindle and, you know, for everything. Because even though I will never own one of those newfangled things, I prefer to hold a book in my hands. Me too. Thank I you. I still see the, you know, massive value of having them in the marketplace. And it's it's such a brilliant thing. I mean, it's just great. 
that somebody can point and click and have the book in 10 seconds. It takes 10 seconds to download. I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm from the 17th or 18th century, and I just, I'm surprised I know how to use this keyboard. I really am. Um, it's, uh, it's amazing. I mean, we live in a technological age. It's, it's incredible. We're so fortunate to live in this age and time, and it's our job to make sure that there are future generations and that we don't blow ourselves up or spoil our planet to the point where it's unlivable. And, and you know, I know I'm off on another tangent, but people love the, you know, please, everybody, just love the planet well. Treat it as the home that it is for us, even if it's just for a short time, and acknowledge the fact that others will come after us. And let's try to leave something for them. And that's, you know, my last words of wisdom for the night. Okay. And then, um, if you'd like to go, it's fine. But I was going to play that video that you had sent me, the four-minute... Okay, Friday. sure. Yeah, go right ahead. Okay. I'll drink tea. All right. And then you can ask me any questions you might have about it, because it's, it's really groovy. It really is. R.J. Heim, the reporter, did a great job putting it together. I hope you enjoy it. Okay. I'm going to do it right now. Okay, how do I get this full screen? This is a different format than YouTube, I think. Let's see. Okay. Here the place seemed perfect for Roger Parent, who had been raising his family in a troubled Cumberland neighborhood to move them all out to the country. Wife Carolyn and five young girls, Andrea, Nancy, Christine, Cindy, and April, in 1970 to a nearly unaffordable 200-acre spread in Harrisville, complete with a 1700s main house, barn, river, woods, and pond included. The rest of us were very familiar within a week's time that we were sharing space and not alone in the house. There are no laws on the books in Rhode Island requiring former owners to say if a house is haunted or not. Had the parents known, they might have changed their minds. According to the Black Book of Burrowville, an inordinate number of souls lost their lives here. Some, according to the eldest daughter, Andrea, still water the estate. Some who seem to exist only to torture anyone new who would dare claim the old Arnold farm as their own. I describe it frequently as a portal cleverly disguised as a farmhouse. It was surreal. It was unlike anything that any of us had ever considered, expected, or experienced before. There was eight generations of one extended family lived and died in that house prior to our arrival. Some of them never left. Two suicides by hanging, one by poison, the rape and murder of an 11-year-old girl by a farmhand, four men froze to death on the property, two drownings, the list goes on and on. We were standing here, the door began to bang, and I mean bang. Norma Sutcliffe and her husband bought the estate in 1983. It was Jerry that just finally opened it because he feared the glass would break. And then it stopped. Recent photographs show orbs and lights within the structures and on the property. But those are minor in comparison to what the Perrin family went through. There was so much activity there. We literally never knew from moment to moment what was going to happen next. The real trouble began when Mom Carolyn took it upon herself to open up the main fireplace in the house that had been sealed shut by the previous owner. My mother was under siege. There is a spirit in the house. We believe it's Bathsheba Sherman. She really took exception to my mother's presence in the house. She loathed my mother, she lusted after my father, and she coveted the five children. Every family member tells me Carolyn was singled out, attacked and stabbed, tormented one night in bed by a dozen ghosts in her room who pounded flaming torches in unison while chanting, Take leave of this place, or ye too will be dead. Really, it was a test of wills. It was a battle for mistress of the house, and my mother clearly lost. It took ten years for the parents to finally move out. I have lived from the age of twelve years old knowing that there is something beyond our mortal existence. I think the most striking story to come out of looking into what happened to the Perrin family in the decade that they lived in that house that sums up their entire experience comes from Cindy. She tells me of a big old-time radio, this is it, right here, that was in their living room where there were no outlets and it was unplugged. 
on many occasions. She said she and others would walk into the room, it would turn on, and only play one song. Nice. Ice and white satin. satin. That ends like this. Breathe deep. The gathering gloom. Watch lights fade from every room. Cold-hearted orb rules the night. Removes the colors from our sight. Red is gray and yellow white. But we decide which is right. Which is the illusion. R.J. Heim, NBC 10 News in Harrisville. Nice. Very good video. Let's see. Right. Yeah, really, I'm proud to have that out there. They did a really good job. It, yeah. I like the 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 ending part with the I can't speak today. The saying it was mm -hmm. uh, old horror movie Twilight Zone kind of feel to it. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the you know bless his heart. The, they didn't show this piece on set prior to airing it. And the weatherman is standing there getting ready to do the weather. And he freaked out. <laughs> Bless his heart. I mean, they should have forewarned him. It was, uh, yeah, it was quite a moment. I heard an awful lot about that from people from New England who had watched the segment air live. And they said, Mark Searles freaked out. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I mean... It had, it had made quite an impact on the set where it was actually aired. Um, and the anchors, everybody there at, at NBC10 in Providence, they're awesome people. And uh, it was a real pleasure, a real joy to work with that team. And I gave them, I sent them all the photographs and stuff. And uh, they went up and interviewed Norma at the farm. And um, it's a beautiful place, isn't it? It's just mm -hmm. a beautiful place. It does look like a dream house in a way. I mean, to me, I like the, I like the cottage style. Mm -hmm. So that is very much on my own. Well, I will let your throat relax because I know you, <laughs> you've had... Thank you for the stories. I really do appreciate that. Oh, you're very welcome. And I'd be happy to join you again at any time, honey. And you know what? Just take this link and send it out across the universe and let's tell as many people as we possibly can not only about what you do but about this remarkable story because it's not one to be kept to ourselves anymore it's meant to be shared and I thank you for giving me the opportunity to do that with as many people as possible well you're welcome to use this uh, as a link for reference to because it's, it's all meant for your promotion Thank you, sweetheart. You're you're just a lovely, lovely young woman, and I appreciate you. And we'll be back in touch again very soon. All right. I'll get you a book. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, sweetheart. You have a great night. Me too. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for listening in. All right. And I can call you back either tonight or some other time. We can talk more on that as well. Okay. 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 All right, soon. honey. Yeah, I'm going to bed now. I love okay. you, but I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to bed now. Yeah. Uh, we had thunderstorms in the middle of the night last night. I was up half the night. I'm exhausted. So uh, we'll talk tomorrow. All right. Touch base with you in the morning, okay? Okay. Good night. Okay. Sweet dreams. Good night, honey. Sweet dreams. All righty, guys. Now that was the author, Andrea. And she did an amazing job. She talked, and honestly, I can't thank her any more than that because she really did a great job. So if you want to check out her book, you can go on my Facebook, on her Facebook. We've got all the links on the side menu over here. In fact, if you need me to enlarge it, I can. There's a lot of links, more than this shows, so just gotta keep up with times I guess and look at all of her Facebook updates and everything um, if you want to email her she has the email that is going to be archived in this video and then she's got a Flickr, she's got a YouTube, she's got a couple of YouTubes LinkedIn, Google, Twitter, 
there's no way you guys can't follow her. So keep in touch. And the next episode of Guardian Radio will be either Wednesday or Thursday or both. So keep up with the updates on the site. See you soon. Good night.